So under the sort of the larger umbrella of Ordo Templi Orientis, there are kind of two streams or paths, I guess one could say. One is initiatory and the other is ecclesiastical. Oftentimes people will traverse both of these. Uh, and at a certain point in initiatory experience, it becomes necessary to, to be on both. But, um, but certainly in the, in the beginning stages, some people will exclusively pursue one or the other. The ecclesiastical aspect of things uh, I'll talk about first, and the, the sort of the church underneath OTO called Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica, which means Gnostic Catholic Church. And I'll just define those terms a little bit. Gnostic meanings, means uh, having to do with knowledge as opposed to faith. Right? It's direct knowledge of the divine that's within each of us. Catholic, okay, we all have the immediate association of the Roman Catholic Church, but Catholic, the word Catholic just means universal. And ecclesia just means like an assembly. And the Gnostic Catholic Church was incorporated into the OTO in, in 1908. It actually existed before OTO did. And it existed for a while prior to its own acceptance of the, of the law of Thelema. Um, in fact, it was in OTO before the church itself really formally accepted Thelema. And the, it, it did so in 1920. As it is uh, currently uh, manifested in OTO, it represents the aspect of OTO that administers the Gnostic Mass and various other associated ecclesiastical rituals. Aleister Crowley wrote Book 15, The Gnostic Mass, in 1913 in Moscow. In many ways, it is similar in structure to the Mass of the Roman Catholic Church, but the comparison ends with structure, as the Gnostic Mass is a celebration of the principles of Thelema, not Christianity. It is a Eucharistic ritual, and congregants are expected to take communion by partaking of the sacrament, consuming a cake of light and drinking a glass of wine, and then after eating the one and drinking the other, proclaiming, there is no part of me that is not of the gods. The officiants in the Gnostic Mass, the priest and priestess and deacon and, and children, um, they're not intermediaries as they are in the Roman Catholic Church or other Christian traditions. They're not intermediaries between the congregants and their gods. Rather, they illustrate through the allegory and symbol of the dramatic ritual a process by which anyone may come to their own direct knowledge or gnosis of the divine within them. Crowley wrote in his confessions, quote, Human nature demands, in the case of most people, the satisfaction of the religious instinct. And to very many, this may best be done by ceremonial means. I wished, therefore, to construct a ritual through which people might enter into ecstasy, as they have always done, under the influence of appropriate ritual, end quote. So he's saying, basically, Religious activity is something that's instinctive to us all. I think we can see that like bear out over the course of history. Whenever any religion or religious movement has been suppressed, it's ended up coming out anyway, usually violently. Um, so I think it's it's like observable fact of nature that at least most humans have some instinct toward religious activity. And he's saying he wanted to create a way for people to do that in a way that's appropriate and not subverting their will to that of the priest, for example, or taking on superstitious beliefs, but rather to create a ritual where people can do that, where they're exalting their own individual nature and not taking on superstition. And uh, the manifesto of Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica states that our church makes the sacraments of the new aeon available to those who are prepared to receive them as we advance in adherence to the law of do what thou wilt. Uh, so that's a little bit about the Mass. There are other ecclesiastical things that I'll, I'll just mention briefly. Um, there's the Feast for Life, as specified in the Book of the Law. The Feast for Life is held in celebration of the birth of a child. Baptism is a short public ritual that is usually given just before the celebration of the Gnostic Mass. Philema rejects the concept of original sin. In Christianity, baptism like washes away sin and stuff like that. 
Uh, for us, baptism is a symbolic entrance into the Thelemic community of worshipers, as well as a commemoration of the individual's birth into life and the church. Confirmation is the rite that confer, uh, confers formal lay membership in Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica. Within this rite of confirmation, the individual confirms that it is their true will to join the church as a soldier of Thelema and is anointed as a servant of Rahur Kuit. Other ecclesiastical ceremonies include the Feast for Fire and Feast for Water, which are for uh, a male and female, respectively. This is specified in the Book of the Law. Crowley explains that the Feast for Fire or Feast for Water are held in celebration of the dawning of puberty of a boy or a girl. Marriage is a rite that I think <clears throat> is a part of uh, Western culture, more so than of Thelema specifically, in the sense of sort of forming contracts of kinship between people. The Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica has no official rite of marriage, but um, Helena and Tau Apirion have written a very good one. There are others that people have written on their own. The founder of Second Mott Lodge has written a Thelemic marriage that's on our website. Uh, many priests and priestesses are willing to write, collaborate, or officiate at marriages for members who desire to celebrate their love in this way. Uh, it's really marriages in our church, and even prior to the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica being incorporated into OTO, marriage has been considered more of a benediction of an existing natural marriage rather than a creation of a marriage. Like in the Christian tradition, they often you know, say that you're married now in God's eyes. Well, in Thelema, if you are united with someone in love under will, you are married. That's what marriage is. And um, so a, a kind of Thelemic marriage is really more of a recognition of that and a blessing of that than anything. Uh, one question on that. Mm -hmm. um, like in light of... Um, I don't know, about a month ago, Beth posted that thing, how she gave a speech and a talk at, uh, I think it was a gay rights uh -huh. uh, like thing for, I, I don't know, whatever they were speaking about, how religion to the gays. Uh -huh. I was just wondering, um, I mean, essentially, the lemma, you are in the OTO, you mm -hmm. can have gay marriages, yeah. you could also have multi-partner marriages, yeah. or whatever. I mean, yep. marriage could yep. redefine however the participants or the desires to be married find marriage exactly right and that that's a great segue um, as in the in the Gnostic mass there's a there's there's a series of 11 prayers that the deacon says called collects and one of them is about marriage or it's entitled marriage and it says upon all that this day unite with love under will let fall success may strength and skill unite to bring forth ecstasy and beauty answer beauty our church has never had any policy prohibiting or discouraging the performance of wedding ceremonies for same-sex couples within our church. Same-sex couples have always been welcome to request our clergy to officiate at their wedding ceremonies. We treat same-sex weddings the same way we treat any wedding. Our church supports the principle that basic rights belong to all of us, not just the majority. We actively encourage committed same-sex couples if it is their will to pursue marriage within our church, or multi-partner marriages, or, like you say, anything that someone wants to celebrate as a union of love under will. Ordination is available to the offices of deacon, priestess, and priest. Uh, and it is conferred upon a period of novitiate training and after fulfilling the appropriate requirements. Visitation is another thing that is done by the church, and that's a simple, could be as simple as a congregant bringing a goblet of wine and a cake to uh, the ill. In cases of severe illness, uh, there's a ceremony that is available for more formal visitation by clergy. We also have last rites, which are ideally performed by a priestess and dame companion of a holy graal. The ceremony is typically employed in the administration of the sacrament. Um, there's a, it's actually in, still in draft form, but people use it um, as it is written, on, and it's on the web. There's also the greater feast for death, uh, when a loved one dies, it is appropriate to celebrate with a greater feast for death, uh, as it is written in the Book of the Law. We offer this ceremony at Second Mott Lodge. 
uh, ceremony written by Tao Apirion, which includes a reading of Liber 106 concerning death by Aleister Crowley. Any members who are close to the deceased may, of course, bring their own ideas for the celebration. And then another thing people a- often ask us, well, I don't know about often, but sometimes we get the question if we do exorcisms. We do not do exorcisms. <laughs> According to the Grandmaster Sabazius, quote, Not only is the concept of spirit possession largely a superstitious response to the symptoms of mental illness, or even in some cases social or religious nonconformity or disobedience, but the idea that clergy have the power and the moral right to cure such behavior lends itself too easily to a whole spectrum of abuses. So that's, okay, pretty much everything about I have to say about the church aspect of OTO. Okay, so the initiatory side. We had talked about the Ecclesia Gnostica Catholica. Now we'll talk about Mysteria Mystica Maxima, or MMM. Originally, this was the name of the OTO degree system in Great Britain. The degree system in Great Britain was headed by Aleister Crowley, and eventually this MMM was absorbed into the regular system of the order, and it now includes the degrees from Minerval through 7th degree. And I'm going to quote from Aleister Crowley where he wrote in Magic Without Tears about dramatic ritual to discuss kind of the nature of these initiations. He says, What is dramatic ritual? It is a celebration of the adventures of the god whom it is intended to invoke. The Bacchae of Euripides is a perfect example of this. Now in the OTO, the object of the ceremonies being the initiation of the candidate, it is he whose path in eternity is displayed in dramatic form. So just to pause the quote for a moment. So he's saying essentially that the initiatory rituals are dramatic invocations of the God that is the candidate. Continuing, what is the path? One, the ego is attracted to the solar system. Two, the child experiences birth. Three, the man experiences life. Four, he experiences death. Five, he experiences the world beyond death. Six, this entire cycle of point events is withdrawn into annihilation. In the OTO, these successive stages are represented as follows. Minerva, first degree initiation, second degree consecration, third degree devotion, fourth degree perfection or exaltation, and perfect initiate or Prince of Jerusalem. Some of the degrees have numbers and some of them have titles. Like, for example, the first initiation you take is Minerval, which is actually not the first degree. The first degree comes after Minerval. He, he continues to say, um, of these events or stations upon the path, all but number three, which is the second degree, are single critical experiences. So just to recap, um, Minerval, the attraction of the soul to the solar system, birth, death, Afterlife and the annihilation of all these are single critical experiences. We, however, are concerned with the very varied experiences of life, the second degree, which is not a single point event, but our whole life, right? So all subsequent degrees of the OTO, after a perfect initiate, are accordingly elaborations of the second degree, since in a single ceremony, it is hardly possible to sketch, even in the briefest outline, the teaching of initiates with regard to life. The rituals 5th degree through ninth degree are then instructions to the candidate how he should conduct himself, and they confer upon him gradually the magical secrets which make him a master of life. Pretty basic summary of what the point of initiation is and, and what the symbolism is of the first series of initiations, and, and then everything after that is an elaboration of that second degree which is symbolic of life. Initiation can be conferred only in a physical ceremony conducted by a chartered initiator. Oftentimes people are curious about what the requirements are. Uh, For these Man of Earth initiations, there are three requirements. You must be free, i.e. not enslaved or imprisoned or on parole, um, and legally able to enter a contract. Uh, That's the first requirement, freedom. Full age is the second requirement, uh, which is 18 for Minerval in first degree or 21 for subsequent degrees. And then the third requirement is that you be on good report, which simply means that you're vouched for by two sponsors. 